Glad to see you at the evening service, and we trust that we can worship God together in a strange means in some respects, but nevertheless we can worship him. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father, our God in heaven, we're glad to meet in your holy presence. We think of the words of the psalm writer when he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up unto the house of the Lord. And what a privilege to gather in your holy presence, to call on your name, to seek your face. And we pray that as we gather here and others gather with us across the internet, that you would remember us, O God, and visit us in all the, the power of your Holy Spirit and have dealings with us, we pray, for we very much stand in need of you. And to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 97. I'm going to read. It's quite a long hymn, this, but a beautiful hymn. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb of the anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died to be, your Saviour and your matchless King through all eternity. Crown him the Son of God before the worlds began. And you who tread where he has trod, crown him the Son of Man who every grief has known, by which we are oppressed, and takes and bears them for his own, that all in him may rest. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious from the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Those wounds, yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his burning eye at mysteries so bright. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways from pole to pole that wars may cease and all be prayer and praise. Forever shall he reign, and earthly princes fall before his throne, the Lamb once slain, the Sovereign Lord of all. Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres in majesty sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for you have died for me. Your praise shall never, never fail through all eternity. And what a great hymn that is, and how wonderfully it speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read from God's Word this evening in Romans and in chapter 3, and I'm going to begin at verse 9. And I've got a funny feeling that we may have read this passage recently, but we're going to read that anyway tonight. So that's Romans in chapter 3, and at verse 9, let us hear together God's Word. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says... It says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. We thank God for the reading of his holy word. We'll come back and make some reference to that in passing anyway. This evening, we're going to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we turn into your presence once again. And we thank you that we're able to come freely, that there's a way that has been opened for us through the perfections of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And we come in Jesus' name tonight, O God, not in any sense trusting to a righteousness of our own. Even our Bible reading this evening has reminded us that in your sights there is none that does good. We've all um, walked away from God. We've all failed you. We've all grieved you. And your word reminds us that the law of God stops every mouth. It stops us in our tracks, O oh God. It shows us, it demonstrates to us that we're sinners. But we thank you that you're a, a gracious God and full of mercy, full of compassion, full of long, long suffering. But a God who is just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And so we thank you tonight that as we gather in your presence, it's not in any sense of our own merit, but in the perfect righteousness of another that we rest and trust in Jesus, that we say with the hymn writer, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And we do, O oh God, we cling to our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, to his perfect righteousness, to his wonderful holiness, and the fact that tonight we're accepted in the Beloved. Persuade us, we pray again, of these great and wonderful truths and keep us well away, O oh God, from any idea of our own righteousness, any idea that we have somehow merited um, the blessing and the presence of God. Keep us a long way from that, O oh God, we pray. And keep us resting and trusting in the Saviour. We thank you for each other. We thank you that we can be in your holy presence this evening. We thank you for the gathering of the saints. And we thank you for those who will gather with us this evening across the airways. And we pray your blessing upon them also and that you would do them good. We need your word to reach into our hearts for another week. And you've made so plain to us that man cannot live by bread alone. We can try. We know that we can so easily try. We can try and enjoy life. We can try and enjoy its substance. We can try and enjoy the many blessings that are brought to us. But in truth, O oh God, without enjoying you, we'll really enjoy nothing. Help us, we pray, that we may enjoy our God, that we may enjoy your word, and that as we nourish ourselves upon the words of eternal life, that we may have joy, deep down, lasting, abiding joy 
deep down in our hearts. That's what we really need, O oh God. We look around and we see a, a world that is full of discontentment, a world that is desperately looking to fill an empty hole. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus and the one who is indeed the source of all last. Father, from houses and cars, we're away from holidays anyway, but keep us away from these things. Keep us, we pray, rather looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for that joy that was set before him was to endure all the cross would bring. We thank you for him and we pray, O oh God, help us to treasure him in our hearts. We do pray for the incoming week. We've different things going on in our lives. Perhaps some will be um, quiet and will enjoy a quieter week. Others are going to be very busy. We pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one. And whatever our situation and our station in life, give us grace, O oh God, we pray, that we might live out a, a new week for, for you, for your glory, for your praise, and for your honor. Have dealings with us, we pray. And come and quicken our hearts and minds in the things of God day by day by day. Do help us if we're in the workplace or whether we're working at home and having conversations across the internet with people that we have to deal with. Whatever it is, oh God, that we do, help us to represent the Saviour well and to show forth the praise of him who called us out of darkness into his most marvellous light. We pray that you would remember our land and nation and we're constantly <coughs> praying in this vein at this time for we realise that our land and nation need you in a very special way. So remember us, we pray. And visit us, O oh God, with your special grace, with your long, long suffering, with mercies that we're in no sense worthy of. But remember us, O oh God, in grace and mercy and blessing. We do pray for those of our number who perhaps are sad because of circumstance and the weak may bring even more sadness. Do you remember those, Lord, who aren't just so strong and they want to be out, but they can't be out. Bless them and do them good, we pray. And for our children and our young people who face perhaps another strange and different week in school encourage them and uphold them help them to be wise keep them out of danger keep them heavenly father um, at a distance from all that would be dangerous we pray your blessing and grace so visit us now cleanse us from sin come to us with your word we need the word we need you to deal with us O oh god and we pray these are prayers in Jesus name amen amen well announcements um, announcements um, are simply I suppose we'll meet next Sunday morning and evening it'll be communion in the evening here in church um, it's going to be a little bit different the elements are going to be um, individualized so everyone should feel very safe for that reason alone we've had a little practice we'll have another practice i'm sure um, to make sure everything is done in a safe as way safe a way as possible we'll get it right tuesday night we're hoping to meet for bible study and prayer meeting the bible study will be recorded but we'll watch it together and we'll move on to the prayer meeting and we'll be able to share that then with those at home and so if you you don't feel able to be with us um You'll be able to join with us at home in exactly the same way that you have. If you haven't joined and you'd like to join, that's not a problem. We can easily um, help you to, to join and get you um, on with us. Please do that. It's great to pray together. I think it's been um, just amazing to be able to pray together all the way through these last six months. Sometimes the technicalities haven't been so wonderful, but at the moment... Let's hope it's the case on Tuesday too, but at the moment they have been running really well. So if you can be with us, that would be great one way or another. We will um, hopefully be having children's meeting on Friday evening across the 
internet. So do remember the children's meeting folk. That's a, um, a new thing for them. There are technicalities to get around and we trust that they will all go well. We need to contact children. That's going to happen this week. It's not going to be so easy for children to be perhaps so positive about that for there's so much about the internet but we're trying our best to do what we can so let's be positive about these things and hope for the future we're going to read from a psalm psalm 40 it's a psalm that we know well the reason for reading it psalm 40 and at verse 1 i waited long upon the lord he heard my cry and turned to me he raised me from the slimy pit and from the mire he pulled me free he set my feet on solid rock, a place to stand both firm and broad. He put a new song in my mouth, a joyful hymn of praise to God. Many will look with godly fear and on the Lord alone rely. The wonders you have done, O Lord, how many and how great they are. Your plans for us are far beyond our power to number or declare. You did not ask that calves or goats be brought as sacrifice for sin. But you have opened up my ears. You did not seek burnt offering. Then I declared, Lord, I have come. It's written of me in the scroll. I want to do your will. My God, your law is in my heart and soul. It's a wonderful psalm. We love to sing that psalm. Usually the older version is the one we're perhaps more familiar with, but it's a wonderful psalm, and we will make a passing reference to that there this evening. Now, on Sunday evenings, we have been thinking through and what God is like. There's a reason for doing this. We always need to think through what God is like. The children of Israel, it's their sad history that they forgot what God was like. And the tragedy then is that they veered, they turned aside to idols. And they, they worshipped idols and they corrupted themselves and they ended up in great trouble. That was Daniel's day. And it's in Daniel's day that we find this text Daniel 11, verse 32, where we read, The people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And the whole point, really, of looking at that text is that it reminds us that, really, for the child of God, that's where his strength comes from. It's in knowing his God. It's in walking with his God. And we see an example, a very clear example of that in Daniel and in his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we've been thinking these last um, weeks about the fact that God is the eternal God. He's before time, he's beyond time. He's the creator God who made all things by the word of his power out of nothing. Think about that. He's the God who is king. He's the God who is sovereign, the God who cares for us, the God who cares enough to speak to us about sin and bring conviction into our lives, the God of truth who keeps his promises, the God who is long-suffering, the God who is wise. And then last week we thought about the God who is merciful. Now I'm trying to some extent to interleave these thoughts about God. And so I want to think this evening about the fact that God is righteous. He's righteous. It's very much bound up with um, the, the thought of the gospel, really, and we often need to... To, to, to touch this string and to remind ourselves that the gospel isn't about unrighteousness. It's about the righteousness of God. Three little headings then. God's eternal righteousness. And by that I'm saying really that God will, hasn't changed and he never will change. He always was righteous. And you'll never change him. You'll never bend him. God's evidenced righteousness. Think about the Lord Jesus and what God was willing to do to satisfy his righteousness. And then what I've put down is God's engaging righteousness. And I mean by that, that if we believe that God is righteous, we're going to engage with that truth. We're going to catch hold of that truth. 
We're going to seek to live out that truth day by day. God's eternal righteousness, God's evidence righteousness, God's engaging righteousness. Let's talk about God's eternal righteousness. Now, it's very important from the beginning there this evening to realize and recognize that God is only righteous. By that, I don't mean that um, God is the only one righteous, although that is true, but that's not what I'm saying. What I mean by that is this, that, that God is only righteous. He's never been unrighteous. He never could be unrighteous. He could never do the wrong thing. God will only ever do the right thing. When it comes to consumer items, uh, we live, don't we, um, with so much variety, so much choice. It's almost any color, any size, any quality. You can sort of pick and choose. There's so much choice. People from an older age would be amazed the day when you went in and you bought and there, was, there wasn't any choice. There was just the one and that's what you took. You took that or you didn't take anything, but it's not that anymore. There's so much choice. But when we think of God, there's no picking and choosing with God. God only does righteousness. He can never do unrighteousness. So here's a young person, and um, in his teenage years, he's gone down the wrong avenues. He's got in with wrong people, we might say. He's taken wrong choices. His life is looking a bit of a mess. He kept getting into trouble. But then, as sometimes happens, he gets beyond... I don't know whether it's the magic age of 20 or what, but he gets beyond the age of 20, 21, and suddenly a penny seems to drop. And I'm not talking about conversion. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the power of the gospel. You see this across the board, don't you? And here's someone, and they've been making a right mess. They were always getting into trouble. But suddenly the penny seems to drop. It doesn't happen for everyone, but the penny seems to drop. And suddenly... They're a bit older, they're a bit wiser, and what a difference. And they see all the mistakes they've made, and they're only too willing to own up to them. And suddenly they want to do the right thing. And they're not going to do everything right, but there's a complete change of attitude, and suddenly they want to do right. God doesn't change. People change. young person may change for good, for bad. Older people may change for good, for bad. But God doesn't change. He's the eternal, unchanging God, the only wise God, but he only does righteousness. That's all he does. He only does righteousness. God doesn't have any reason to learn from his mistakes because he never makes a mistake. How wise um, we need to be, isn't it, to, to learn from our mistakes. But God, he doesn't need to learn from his mistakes. He never makes a mistake. God never slips. He never trips up. He never has to regret. He only ever does what is right. Now, the scripture makes that truth very plain to us. So here we are in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's chapter 32, and um, we're reading there at verse Three, remember that Deuteronomy is Moses and he's addressing the younger generation. He wants them to remember what God is like. Their fathers had made many mistakes and they'd forgotten what God was like. And there are many examples of that in the book of Numbers. But here we are now in the book of Deuteronomy. We're about the younger generation to go into the promised land. And God is reminding them of what, uh, Moses rather, is reminding them of what God is like. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. That's God. All of God's ways are upright. He never does unrighteousness. He never could do unrighteousness. Verse 17 of Psalm 145, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. 
And there are many other passages like that that we could turn to this evening. But there's, there's one or two there that we perhaps have been close to in recent days. So here's the book of Nehemiah. And we've been talking to the children about Nehemiah. And here's uh, part of their confession of sin in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 8. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. And what they're saying is, we've found ourselves in trouble. we dug a hole for ourselves. You've not been unrighteous. But we have. And that's, that's man, isn't it? We get things wrong. God is utterly right. He always does the right thing. Now, that's simply not true of man, is it? However upright we might think um, another to be, they can surprise us. However upright we might think ourselves to be, we can surprise ourselves and we can do the wrong thing. And there's none of us beyond that. We can all do the wrong thing. Someone told me just recently there of how shocked they were. They're in a certain situation and something got said. And it wasn't a nice something that got said. It was an unpleasant something that got said. Not in terms of arguing or anything like that, but something that wasn't very nice in terms of language and so on. And they got an enormous shock. They hadn't seen it coming. This wasn't what they thought of the person who had said what had been said. But that's not God. God is utterly righteous. And God is concerned for righteousness in his creation. Someone um, quoted from Psalm 7 in their prayer on a Tuesday evening. And Psalm 7 tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day. You'll see it there if you look it up in chapter 7 and verse 11. God is a just judge and angry with the wicked every day. That's God. God is utterly righteous. God can't view unrighteousness with indifference. Sometimes we feel upset, don't we? We see wrong things being done and whoa, we're boiling inside, we're annoyed. We can't get any peace. It's not fair, it's not right. I know that in wider society there can be a very flippant um, attitude to justice and you can find justice being mocked and so on and justice is mocked by the wrongdoer. We saw, didn't we, a few weeks ago, those, that there were awful pictures of those three young men who were involved in dragging that police constable to his death. And they laughed. They laughed on the pictures that the press managed to, to take, but apparently they laughed in the court. They laughed. They dragged a police officer to his death. And they laughed. It's despicable, isn't it? It's despicable. A man may think that he gets away with that. He'll not get away with that. He may, in terms of justice in the here and now, but he'll not be getting away with that. Justice will catch up. God is righteous. You'll not change him. You'll not move him from that. You can play your tricks. You can do this and that. But God will catch up. And so that we know what God's righteousness is, God gives us his law. Ever thought about that? I know that the word law can come across, even in Christian circles, in a very negative way. You know, the thought of the law in the Garden of Eden, that simple command that they could eat from every fruit, but they couldn't eat from the, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and so on. That could come across, that could be presented, that could be thought of in a very niggardly way. 
But actually, it was God being wonderfully kind. And God is saying, look, there's a line you mustn't cross. And it has to do with my righteousness. And God gives us his law in his word. And God is setting out for us his righteousness. He doesn't leave us guessing. He doesn't leave us guessing. He tells us. He tells us. We read from Romans and 3. But we could have read, I suppose, from Romans and 2. And at verse 14, we read there, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, in other words, they don't have the book in their hand, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although they not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. And you know, each and every one of us is, we actually have something of God's law written on the heart. We know murder is wrong, don't we? We drummed it at home. It's almost a death penalty at home for lying. The children will tell you that. If you got caught lying at home, you were in very serious trouble. But you, you almost don't need to tell children. They kind of know that lying is wrong. Now it needs to be reinforced, but they kind of know that, don't they? It's written on their hearts to some extent. But of course God has written it down. It's written in his Ten Commandments. It's written in his word. And it's not just for us. It's for all men. And it's not just a Christian code. It's for all men. And so God tells us about marriage between a man and woman. And it's God's law, isn't it? It's right and wrong. God tells us about the Sabbath day. And it's not a matter of pick and choose. It's a matter of right and wrong. So when we think of God and the fact that God is righteous, how concerned should his people be for his law? We need to watch ourselves that we don't get into a negative attitude towards the law of God. Because if we've been truly reconciled by God's grace, we should have a heart for doing what God says. Remember the Lord Jesus. And remember that these are, you know, they're almost his parting words with his apostles in John and chapter 14. And we read there, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. The person who loves God is concerned for his word, for his law. God's eternal righteousness. That's what God is. He's righteous, eternally righteous. But God's evidenced righteousness. I want to talk about his son, of course. And I want to um, think of those amazing words in the book of Galatians and in um, chapter 4, a little bit of talk at home about um, Christmas. You th may think that's a little bit early, but this is often a, um, a text that we think of at Christmas. And we read there, when the fullness of the time had come, Galatians 4 verse 4, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And I want you to think about this righteousness of God and to think about the fact that such is the holy righteousness of God that when God sent his son he had to satisfy all of the righteousness, all of the holiness, all of the justice of God. So often in life there can be special treatment. And so it may be family gets special treatment, I don't know. Friends get special treatment. 
And so you, you might have someone working in Asda. We were in that situation once. And you had somebody working in Asda. And so because you've got someone in the family working in Asda, we all get a discount. Well, that was okay, wasn't it? You know, we got special treatment. You might have someone who works for an airline, in which case you're going to cash in because you might get special treatment on the, on the maybe not at the moment, but anyway, um, special treatment on the, on the, on the flights. My father worked for Crossville Motor Services and we got special treatment when it came to traveling on the bus. My father never bothered to really learn to drive. He did try it one time, but he never, and he had one eye, you see, but um, he never really bothered for, it was too much trouble. And why did, he, why did he need to bother? He had a whole fleet of buses <laughs> at his hands really and we traveled everywhere on the bus and we all traveled of course at wonderful rates you see in a sense we were kind of special but when God sent his son into the world he didn't send him on special terms such is the justice and the holiness and the righteousness of God that when God sent his son into the world, he was sent into the world on the same basis that you and I were sent into the world. He didn't circumvent the rules. There wasn't some special kind of treatment. There wasn't a discount. He was born of a woman. He was made under the law. The same penalty of the law hung over his head as hangs over ours. The boss's son might get treated far more generously or far more harshly. You can never be sure in that situation, can you? But so righteous is God that his son is treated on exactly the same basis as we are. Humiliating as it was, he had to be born of a woman. And of course, we can extend that then, and we can say that when it came then to his life, he lived it perfectly before the law. His whole life was one of obedience. And God arranged it in a way that even things that were done for the Lord Jesus fulfilled the law. You remember in Luke and um, chapter 2, and you read there, um, verse 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And Joseph and Mary were not perfect. They had their sins but they were concerned for the law of the Lord. And everything that was done in regard to the Lord Jesus Christ was done in regard to God's law. And when we see him then, um, in and of himself, as it were, living his life, he's so anxious to do what is right. Here's John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? Jesus says, Matthew 3 and verse 15, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he wants to do what is right. He wants to honour his God. Talking to someone in the week about the temptations. And in the temptations, of course, he demonstrates he's so completely committed to doing what God says. Satan comes, but the Lord Jesus answers, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. 
Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he's for doing what God says. And his whole life is like that. And so he meets with that, um, that woman, doesn't he? And he's talking to her. His, his disciples have gone into the, to the city. They're worried about him. And they're anxious that he would eat. And what does he say? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And he's, he's just totally taken up with doing what God says. And you see that all through his life. And we read that, that 40th Psalm. And the reason that we read that 40th Psalm is, of course, that it does speak very directly of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that from the book of Hebrews. It says of him there, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened. In other words, he had an obedient heart. His ears were opened. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. And that's the Lord Jesus. And he cries in the garden, Father, if it possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And we read, I'm flitting quickly here, but we read then um, time and again of the fact that he perfectly obeys his God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Two, 1 Peter, rather, chapter 2, verse 22. His whole life was one of submission to the law of God. And we can go a little bit further. For he died to vindicate the righteousness of God. And it becomes so clear in his death, doesn't it? We said last week that God's mercy evoked his grace. But it never bypassed his righteousness. We often see examples of rules being bent when it suits. It drives us insane, isn't it? You know, you see that, rules being bent. Somebody gets special favor. Does that not drive you insane? Does that not drive you mad? It didn't happen with Jesus Christ. Nope, it didn't happen with Jesus Christ. God fulfilled his righteousness in his son. God, God delivered his justice in his son. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God sent forth as a propitiation. Propitiation means one who bears the anger of God and thereby brings peace with God. Whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God didn't bend the rules. He couldn't bend the rules. God could do it no other way. God visited his wrath upon his son. Christ bore the anger of God that was due upon us. That's why we can be so certain there's no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. God is never going to relent. God is never going to go soft. God is never going to change the terms He sent his son to deal with his justice, to deal with his righteousness. God's eternal righteousness, God's evidence righteousness. And then what I've referred to, it was Friday, there wasn't a great deal of time, I'm afraid, but God's engaging righteousness. And it, it engages with us and we engage with it in our response to this righteous God. The first thing to think about is this, that God is one who vindicates. 
And in life we can often feel that we've been cheated and dealt with unfairly. We can become negative about that. We can become cynical about that. There's a real danger, isn't there? There are times in the providence of God when there doesn't seem to be any fairness, there doesn't seem to be any justice, when wrong seems to triumph. We see it in the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And wrong seems to triumph. We've seen it, I'm not going to allude to Psalm 73 in any detail tonight, but you see it there in Psalm 73. And how trying, it's not just Psalm 73, it's there in Psalm 17, it's in different Psalms. And the psalmist is struggling with unfairness. And we struggle with unfairness. But of course, ultimately, God will deliver on it all. And ultimately, God will catch up. So later in the book of Romans and in chapter 12, and what do we read there? We find Paul saying, verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And God makes clear that he's a God who catches up. He's a God who catches up, and we can afford to leave these things with God. That's the, the urging of Psalm 37, isn't it? Trust in the Lord. Leave it with him. Maybe you're in that kind of situation at the moment and it just feels so unfair. Now, just because we say, you know, it feels unfair doesn't always mean it is unfair. You need to be careful. But you may be in that situation and you may say, well, it feels so unfair. This is so unfair. So unfair. Well, God is so concerned about what is fair and right that he sent his son into the world. So he'll sort these things out. It's a strong warning to us, isn't it, not to be unfair. But let's not forget that God is righteous. We must be careful because God doesn't just overlook the wrongdoings of his children. We ought to be quick to confess our sins, didn't we? But even that doesn't necessarily mean that God simply overlooks. Of course, the great example of that is David. And we read this morning from David's Psalm of Contrition, Psalm 51. And he asks for forgiveness. Wonderful that he did. But God had already made it plain that though he would forgive, there would be consequences to what had been done with Bathsheba. There would be a price to pay. So we need to remember that God is a righteous God. We need to be careful if we say this God is our friend. He's a righteous God. If we're not concerned for his will, for his righteousness, no use. No use. And then think of the fact that God has righteously dealt with our sin. There's perhaps nothing, I don't know, more upsetting than being given great hopes and promises that turn out to be false, false. And um, there can be promises and then they, they turn out to be false. You've been duped. You've been duped. Horrible feeling, isn't it? The thought that you've been duped. Eh? You're watching a, an advert on the, the TV there one night, I don't know what night it was. And I think I've got the name right. 
You can tell me afterwards if I got it wrong. Is it Kazoo? Kazoo? Is it Kasu that now advertise and you can ring up and buy a car over the internet and they deliver it in this big van? You've got a week to make your mind up. And Chris said, fancy buying a car on the internet, she said. Well, I bought one. <laughs> that blue one, that's how I bought it, really. <laughs> I needed a car, I bought it over the phone because it was advertised on the internet. It's okay, it's all right. It's okay. These people give you a week to change your mind. They say, I don't know, a week to change your mind. Imagine getting duped, isn't it? And you sold a pup, you sold something, but it's not what it turns out to be. Sometimes you read, we've never had this happen to us. We did go to one place one time in France that was a bit like the Adams family, you know, and... Mm, they talk about that at home from time to time. It's a bit scary, I suppose. But imagine getting duped and you, 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 you book your holiday destination. You read people doing this, don't you? And they fly into their holiday destination only to find it's a picture off the internet. And that's all it is. That's all it is. God is perfectly righteous and perfectly just. And what he says that he's done in relation to our sins is not just a glowing picture. The promise is that he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. It's not just a, a big box with a little substance. I had an aunt, Auntie Beryl. She's very kind, Auntie Beryl. Very kind. Single lady, never married. She was a teacher, very kind lady. I remember one birthday, there were two presents, two presents. The first present, I was just a little boy, the first present was um, a mo Daniel, a model coach, okay? And you won't perhaps have ever seen one of these, but you used to get coaches in those days. And they had two sets of front wheels. Can you remember that? Remember those? Two sets of front wheels. Two sets of steering wheels. You see, you don't see them around now. But that used to be, um, they had rear wheels, of course, but it was double wheels at the back. And so this was about bearing the, the weight, really, I suppose. And it was a beautiful, beautiful model. And it was amazing. I remember opening it. I was sitting in mum and dad's bed. That's what you did in those days. You know, you piled into bed and opened these presents. And uh, I remember opening this. And then there was another present. And this was remarkable, but after all, this was Auntie Beryl. And Auntie Beryl was a very kind lady, and she loved me. And the other present was bigger. And you know, in a child's mind, Bigger is better, isn't it, you know? Bigger is more. Auntie Beryl was teasing me. And bigger was a box with a picture inside. And that's all it was. Bigger was a box with a picture inside. I think I felt disappointed. I think I felt disappointed will not feel disappointed with God. For in order to satisfy his righteousness and to deal with his justice, God delivered on his son and he paid the price of our sin. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him and it's not an empty picture that when we get to the pearly gates we're going to be disappointed with sorry it's just a picture off the internet and it's not an empty box it's the real thing such is the righteousness of God that God was willing 
to pay the price in his son. He spared not his only son, but delivered him up freely for us all. What a great God he is, how we ought to revere and treasure his righteousness and how we ought then to value that righteousness in his son Jesus and to be lost in wonder, love and praise. 485, we're going to sing. I know that's not much significance to you, but it is to Kenneth, who's sitting there with his hymn book ready. 485, Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds and these arrayed with joy, shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day. And none condemn me, try who may. Fully absolved by you I am. From sin and fear, from guilt and shame. The holy, meek, unspotted lamb. Who from the Father's bosom came. Who died for me, for me to atone. Now for my Lord and God I own. When from the dust of death I rise. To claim my mansion in the skies. This then alone shall be my plea. Jesus has lived, has died for me. 485. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we own before you this evening that you are that righteous and holy and just God, and that none of us of ourselves is able to stand in your presence. For we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God. But we thank you that in order to satisfy justice and in order to redeem us from our sins, God 
in the fullness of the time, sent forth his only son, born of a woman, made under the law, and all to redeem us from our sins. We thank you for Jesus. We pray, O oh God, help us that we may be lost in wonder, love, and praise as we consider the love wherewith that we've been loved and help us to love him who first loved us. Our prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen.